Hi, have you ever wondered how you got to this point? With all the complexity that you have deployed over the years to serve your authentication needs, for your users to authenticate to your devices, your applications, both on-premises and in the cloud. In this opportunity, we bring a perspective for you to think about how you can reduce that complexity for better security, ease of management, and reduction of the costs that are associated with that. My name is Jairo Canena with the Microsoft Identity Team, and I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, my name is Jeevan Best. I'm a Principal Program Manager with Azure Identity Team. I work with customer partner experience team helping customers deploy Azure solutions all across the world. Hiram and I will walk you through some of the interesting patterns to improve security and efficiency today. Hope you enjoy the session. Very well. So to have an idea of what is it that we're going to be touching on during this session, we're going to be talking about authentication infrastructure, how complex is complex, why you should care about, how you can simplify that complexity, and some easy steps that you can start taking on today so you can reduce that complexity. So you would ask, you know, what's complex? How complex is complex? And why, why is that important? So let us start by remembering how we got here. Initially, you set up one corporate network, and with that, you deployed some network switches, some Windows Server Active Directory, maybe several domain controllers based on your regions. You deployed some applications, and your users could have access to those applications by authenticating to the Windows Server Active Directory and being authorized by those applications. But the reality is that those apps were not just applications that would authenticate against Active Directory. You would have applications like header-based authentication applications that would rely on specific headers in the payload to authenticate and authorize the user. Now, when the user would access those applications, the way you could do the access control to these apps was based on a web access management solution that you have deployed that would require some agents in the application server that would uh, intercept these requests from the user and would redirect that in a way uh, or rather intercept that contact the web access management solution so those users could be authenticated and authorized based on attributes of this user on either on Windows Server Active Directory or in a, a third party directory or a database where those attributes resided. But also you can see that those network switches also started to evolve and now you had more complex uh, load balancers with policies on top of that, maybe web application firewalls as well. And um, with that, you also had uh, and realized that not only your users were your employees, but also uh, partners, vendors, suppliers that needed that you needed to collaborate with. So for that, you deployed a DMC, maybe some extranet servers that these users would be able to access, but also your employees. Uh, it started to become more mobile as well. And these remote employees needed to have access to the on-premises applications to keep business continuity. So for that, you deployed some VPN gateway in the DMZ, some uh, NPS, uh, you know, radio servers on-premises that would rely on maybe MFA servers that would strengthen the connectivity every time users would authenticate to the VPN. And when they would authenticate, then they would just tunnel into the corporate network for seamless access. In addition to that, then you have more applications over the years, and these applications started to evolve as well, including their authentication methods. So now you had applications that authenticate using WSFed, SAML, OAuth, and more, most recently OpenID Connect as well. So you deployed something like an ADFS on-premises where you 
register those applications, but also you needed to have consistent uh, and rely a reliable service. So you deployed a SQL Server database where all these uh, application information would reside. So those applications would authenticate against the ADFS. And now you started looking into how to enable those applications for remote access. So you deployed a web application proxy in the DMC. So those remote employees could have access to these modern applications seamlessly without VPN, for example. So now you started thinking of the cloud and you had some SaaS applications also serving your users. So you register those applications in your ADFS. So your users, employees, uh, partners, vendors, and suppliers could have access to those applications as well, making use of all the infrastructure that you had deployed before. And more, more recently, you looked at Office 365, and with that came Azure Active Directory. And here's where you are. So you have applications and um, infrastructure that not only serves different types of users, but also those applications uh, have a diversity of protocols on how they authenticate. And now you end up with, uh, with different islands of access control, different control planes for your different types of applications, making this extremely complex to manage, to support, and in many cases, uh, even, even opening security uh, vulnerabilities in, in different ways. Now, the question is, what can you do? And uh, let us bring up four different things that maybe you can start thinking about that you can deploy today with your Azure Active Directory. The first thing you can do, you can remove dependency on MPS radios for remote access. You can remove dependency on your web access management systems for your applications. You can remove dependencies on your on-premises IDPs or ADFS for your modern and SaaS applications. And ultimately, you can remove federation servers or ADFS for user authentication. So let us go one by one so you can see how easy it would be to take those steps moving forward. Let's dive in and see how we can remove the dependency on the NPS radio servers for the remote access. What you see here is a typical remote access setup where the VPN servers are talking to the NPS servers or the radio servers on-prem behind the load balancer for fallback or the load balancing scenarios. The radio servers might also reach out to the MFS servers, and in this case, there might be multiple servers which need to be load balanced. You might also expect a replica of this for the geo failover scenarios, which probably means a ton of infrastructures required just to make sure that VPN is up and running. What we are seeing is an alternate approach to access the VPN is using an Azure DApp proxy where you can publish the applications at a granular level and provide access to per app rather than the entire network. The similar approach can also be applied using some of our partners as well. So in case you have certain applications which does require VPN and cannot be migrated using the Azure DApp proxy or the partner solutions, you can still modernize the access. What ends up being happening is that the VPN is going to talk to the Azure AD directly using some kind of protocol-based integration. In most of the cases, it's going to be SAML or OpenID Connect. The control plane here becomes your Azure Active Directory where you can decide that who gets access to the VPN and what factors do they have to sign in with to ensure the identity of the user and the device. The net result is you can eliminate some of the redundant infrastructures on-prem like the load balancers for the NPS, the MFA servers on-prem, or the geo-redundant hardware. Let's look at a demo using the Palo Alto Global Protect app. All right, let's jump into the admin experience. The enterprise application is the blade where the admin would start, 
and search for the app in the gallery amongst thousands of other applications which are available. In our example, I've already added the app called Palo Alto. I could search for that in our gallery and go ahead with the simple configuration steps. In this case, this is a SAML-based integration, so we'd see some of the basic parameters being defined, like entity ID, reply URL, and the others. You can also control access to this by defining users and groups under the authorization for the application access. You can also define additional parameters for the remote access by defining a conditional access policy such as MFA. What this allows you to do is go beyond just the user identification and use additional parameters such as device health and the device type. You can also use additional signals from identity protection to ensure that the, the user's sign-in is safe when the login is being performed. What you will also see is an additional capability of being able to control whether this app icon will show up in the My Applications panel, as this application does not initiate any kind of a UI. It is more to control the user login coming from an app. So it is, it makes sense to hide this app from the My Applications panel in this case. Let's quickly jump over to the end user experience. So I'm on my client device, and in this case, I'm trying to connect to my VPN client or the software-defined parameter client, in this case, Palo Alto. So what I do is I try to launch my client app and click on Connect. Now, as you saw, this app is already configured for the SAML sign-on, and it recognizes that and brings up the single sign-on page from the Azure Active Directory. I try and put in my user ID and my password. Now what you will realize is that because we had configured a conditional access policy which requires MFA, I'm prompted for the MFA. At this point of time, I'm using my authenticator app which is considered to be more safe than traditional methods like SMS or phone call and more reliable in case the users do not have data connectivity as well. So I sign up into my authenticator app and click on the approve. And what you will see is the client is trying to connect and authorize. And in case I am authorized to access the application, I'm securely connected. So the connectivity for connecting the VPN is as simple as a single sign-on to any other you know, SaaS app that a user might have. So this becomes the consistent experience either for the SaaS apps or even for the VPN client in this case. All right, with that, Here's a list of the current partners and the newly added partners in the Azure App Gallery. With all these partners, you can have the similar consistent experience and the more secure experience that we just showed you in the demo. Let's talk about how you could remove dependency on your WAM systems for your application access. A typical WAM system setup looks something like this, where the users either internal our externals are connected to the apps, and the authorization is controlled via the web access management software. In certain cases, the web access management software might be required to pull additional information from an external store, such as an LDAP directory. While the WAMP systems-based pattern has been very popular in the last few decades, it still relies on a legacy hero-based authentications. Generally, it cannot support modern authentication protocol capabilities like identity risk, device-based context, native MFA, or even things like passwordless access, which we are seeing day in and day out. An alternate approach to this is using or reusing something that you already own, things like ADCs and load balancers. Herein, you can have a direct native integration with Azure Active Directory where you can set up conditional access rules on per application basis. 
wherein you do not have to modify the app which is sitting behind the load balancer. It's just the source of headers changes from the RAM system to the your to your ADC. It also has capabilities to be able to query those additional data stores, which could be in form of LDAP and bring in some of the attributes which not might not exist in Azure Active Directory for business reasons. Let's jump into a demo where we can see a header-based app trying to authorize using Azure Active Directory and getting additional information or attributes from an external LDAP store. So for this demo, I'm going to use a header-based app called as Oracle eBiz. This is a very popular app and uses header-based authentication. What you will notice here is when I try to access the app, I'm redirected back to Azure authentication. Now this is happening because the ADC in this case, F5, is integrated with Azure AD. And the moment you try to access the application, the first thing you need to do is authenticate with Azure AD and provide the right set of headers. So I go ahead and log in with my credentials as if I would do with any other SaaS app or any modern application with Azure AD. What you will see here is although the app is header-based auth and has no understanding of what an MFA prompt is or what other modern access controls could be put in place. In this case, we are using MFA to get access to the application. I go ahead and approve request. And what you see here is the application has been granted access. I'm logged in with my user and the experience is seamless as with any other modern app. I could go ahead and look at some of the application behaviors as well. And what you will see is the application, although it's legacy in nature, still is able to take advantage of the modern authentication and be able to render the application correctly on the client side. So switching over to the admin side of it, right? if you went to the Azure console and you went to the enterprise applications and search for the F5 gallery apps, in this case, I've this is how I've published my Oracle EBIS Direct. It is as simple as defining the single sign-on parameters on the Azure AD side, exchanging some of the metadata information with the F5, and simply defining your business access rules in terms of conditional access, who can access the app, what are the conditions these apps can be accessed under, and what are the various factors required for the app access. So you can define a complete secure access policy for your legacy applications as if they were any other modern application. So hopping over to the F5 side, for the same app configuration, you can see I have an app deployed using the guided configuration. And here's the quick summary of one of the things that I needed to configure. So in this case, I used a wizard which talks about uh, various steps which I need to take on. With the new F5 version 16, you also have an option to directly publish applications into Azure Active Directory from the F5 console itself without trying to copy and paste metadata information. Now, for the sake of this demo, there are a few parameters I specified, things like entity ID, the users and groups that need to have access to this application, the servers, virtual servers for the F5, the backend server where the actual Oracle application resides, and the single sign-on. So this is where I take in the claims coming from Azure Active Directory and pass them as headers to the F5 and further down the applications. In this example, I'm simply taking a username and passing them as a username header to my Oracle-based application. Now let's take a look at a little more complex scenario where you are going to use an LDAP server to get additional attributes. So we will be using this LDAP server here and connecting to one of the partitions on the LDAP server and trying to query some attributes. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to query a user called Jeevan. And from this user, we're going to try and extract an attribute called as department and pass this as an additional header value into our claim going to an application from the F5. So similar to the previous example, 
we have built up certain configuration. And in this case, there's an additional configuration for the LDAP where we have defined our LDAP credentials and the LDAP server. What you will see is the big, file, big IP. So what you will notice is the flow on how this is going to work. So the step one, the app is going to get authenticated with Azure AD and get a certain set of claims from the Azure Active Directory, including the username, the UPN, and the email address. Then using the LDAP query, we can take certain parameters coming from Azure Active Directory, and for that specific user, we will find the department ID and pass it on as a header claim. The end user experience is as simple as he going to the My Applications portal, where you can see all the applications that he's entitled to access, which can be categorized based on the requirements. Now, our app is called as Deep Insights. I simply click on the icon, and it follows the same flow. It goes to Azure Active Directory, gets authenticated, gives token to the F5, F5 validates, the user is authorized to access this application, takes the claim, queries the LDAP, and brings in the additional attributes from the LDAP. So as you can see, you can reuse some of your existing technology sets that you already own to replace some of the expensive VAMP systems, both in terms of maintenance and also in terms of licensing. So these solutions are quite flexible and can help you cater to solve some of your complex business problems that exist today. So just a quick reminder of the list of partners that we have today to help you achieve the similar solution set we just talked about. Thank you, Jeevan. Now let's move on to the next step and learn how you can remove dependencies on your ADFS for your modern on-premises applications and your SaaS applications in the cloud. So this is where you're at today. You have some modern ADFS applications on-premises. You have some SaaS applications in the cloud. And all of these applications rely on ADFS for authentication. So now let's see what happens when Azure AD comes into the picture. Let's say that you have Office 365. You have synced your users from Active Directory on-premises to Azure AD. And you have configured these users to authenticate to uh, Windows Server Active Directory on-premises via Federation. Now that you have Azure AD, you can take the ADFS applications that are on-premises and register them with Azure AD. To assist you with the migration of your ADFS applications to Azure AD, you can rely on ADFS Connect Health and Azure AD to find out what are the applications that you have in ADFS and what are the steps that you need to take to move these applications to Azure AD. In addition, you can take these SaaS applications and register them in Azure AD as well. And via the application gallery, you will be able to find uh, many of these applications already pre-configured. So you have a very easy and seamless experience of adding them into Azure AD. Now that you have removed the dependencies on your ADFS for your applications, now you can take a step forward and remove the ADFS altogether and your web application proxy in the DMC. When you have your users authenticate to Azure AD directly. In other words, you move from federation to one of the cloud managed methods of authentication. What this means is that now when you configure your user authentication from federated to cloud managed, then now you will be able to get rid of this on-premises infrastructure. All right, so now let's take a look in summary, what really happened after you followed all these steps. The first thing that you did was connecting your VPN to Azure AD. This integration allowed you to remove your dependencies on NPS servers for authentication, and then enrich your connectivity with conditional access and other capabilities. The next thing that you did was removing your dependencies on your web access management solutions for your header-based authentication applications by integrating your core networking deployments and infrastructure with Azure AD. 
Follow to this, you move your applications, your modern applications on premises and your SaaS applications to Azure AD, removing the dependency of these applications authenticating with ADFS on premises. And finally, you move your user authentication from Federation to Cloud Managed Authentication, allowing you to remove your ADFS server farm and your web application proxy server farm in the DMC. And even further, if you expose your applications via your Azure AD application proxy or your core networking infrastructure, you may get to a point that you can even get rid of the dependency of your VPN as well. To the question about what can you do, you can remove dependencies on your MPS radios for remote access by making use of the Azure AD application proxy by integrating your VPN gateway with Azure AD for authentication. You can remove dependencies on your web access management systems by also either using Azure AD application proxy or your core networking infrastructure to integrate this application authentication with Azure AD. You can remove dependencies on on-premises IDPs or ADFS for your modern on-premises applications or your SaaS applications in the cloud by moving these applications to authenticate directly with Azure AD using ADFS Connect Health and the ADFS Activity Report in Azure AD. And finally, you can remove your federation infrastructure by having your users authenticating directly with Azure AD. We have seen customers following these steps, making the access to the applications way more secure, easier to manage these applications from Azure AD from a single control plane, and reducing complexity on their on-premises authentication infrastructure. Well, that's it for now. I hope you have enjoyed this session, and we can see you in the next opportunity. Bye.